Well, hello there and welcome to You Are Not Alone, your guide to mental wellness presented by KJLH LA and it's a production of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. I am Tammy Mack. Hello, everybody. Are you ready to get well mentally? Because that's what we are about to do. Help you and me get well all up in here, up in here. Uh, this, the Chicago School of Professional Psychology has been training and educating multiculturally competent mental health care professionals for nearly 50 years. That's a long time, which means they're doing something right and a lot of something right. Our program is committed to educating our community about mental health and wellness and normalizing conversations about our mental health. Our program will explore mental health and wellness issues that impact us as well as explore ways we can improve our wellness. So every week I will be joined by mental and behavioral health experts who will share their experience experience and expertise, that's important, to help us on our journey to good health and satisfying lives. Today, we want to talk about the mental health challenges Black women face and the opportunities we have to help ourselves and each other. This is one of my favorites, I must say. I'm joined today with forensic psychologist, Dr. Rolinda Shaw. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Hello. And also clinical psychologist, Dr. Loretta Billups. Dr. Billups. Hello. Dr. Shaw graduated from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology with both a master's and doctorate in clinical forensic psychology. Dr. Shaw has extensive experience working with at-risk youth in the foster care system and incarcerated adults with complex trauma. She spent 10 years working in the LA County jail system with individuals diagnosed with severe and chronic mental illness. Her forensic experience includes providing court evaluations and safety assessments for inmates eligible for jail-based diversion programs and re-entry support serves in the community. Uh, Dr. Shaw has a passion for working with underserved communities, not only as a clinician, but also as an adjunct professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. She sees herself as an advocate of social justice who supports the needs of the whole person through the assessment and understanding of how family dynamics, community influence, genetics, and systematic barriers impact mental health. Dr. Shaw. Oh, yes. man. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. Hello, hello. Uh -huh. Hello again, <laughs> yes. Dr. Loretta Billups is both a clinician and relationship coach. She obtained a master's degree in forensic psychology from Argosy University and received her doctorate in applied clinical psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Prior to becoming a clinician, Dr. Billups was employed by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department as a custody assistant and later as a deputy sheriff for almost 12 years years. Dr. Billups currently works as the Director of Clinical Training at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology and simultaneously at Delamo Behavioral Hospital in the Clinical Services Department. Dr. Billups, welcome. Thank you for we want to start with Dr. Shaw because I got to know what a forensic, <laughs> a forensic psychologist is. I have to know. Okay. Well, the beauty of a forensic psychologist is it merges the two worlds of law and mental health. So typically when people think of law, they only think of the jail and prison system, but it's actually anywhere that mental health intersects the court. So that could be in child custody evaluations, that could be in best fit evaluations or working with children in the foster care system that are removed from, you know, the biological family home. It also involves um, working in the court system with juveniles who are in probation camps and juvenile hall systems and just anywhere that the court intervenes within the family dynamic, possibly resulting in some type of removal or separation of an individual from their family support system. Yes, it's because I'm thinking when when I hear forensic, I think DNA, I think <laughs> blood, I think all, everything scientific right. uh, that has to do with fluids in the body. Absolutely. So, 
Yeah. That's what's generally portrayed in on television. And oftentimes, as a, a professor, I have to break the hearts of many students that, you know, we are not going to be like on CSI or, you right. know, criminal minds. Um, it's not just profiling serial killers and and figuring out the the sometimes very ugly part of human nature, but also finding the the programs and the policies that we can develop to change to support the systems that are in place to improve and better the lives of the people in the communities that we serve. Yeah, we always, always on this show learn within the first 30 seconds because I know y'all <laughs> thought it was DNA too when she said forensic, right? <laughs> Let's, uh, Dr. Billups, talk about uh, a clinician. Clinician, what, what is that? So a clinician, or like you stated, I received my degree in applied clinical psychology. I work in individuals who are seriously mental ill, typically in a clinical setting. So your hospitals and things of that nature. And so I work with individuals who may have uh, diagnoses such as depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, and things of that nature, mm -hmm. and provide them therapy as well. And then along with other uh, team members, we work together in order to um, to help the individual navigate their mental health. Okay. And is, this may be a, a, a offbeat question, but I often talk about on my radio show how there are no cures for certain diseases. And then, you know, th there are doctors, but there are no cures. You know, there is no cure for cancer. There's no cure for AIDS. There's no cure for herpes, if we're talking about just mm -hmm. simple things, right? right? Is there a cure for mental illness? When, we talk, when we're talking about a, a clinician and clinical diagnoses of mental illness and, and the specific ones that you just brought up, is this something that you have to deal with for the rest of your life or is there no end to it? Good question. So some of your illnesses, such as like schizophrenia and a bipolar disorder, there's no cure for them. But along with medication and therapy, these things can definitely be mitigated. Um, your things like uh, depression, again, there's no cure. However, with medication and therapy, we can also work with the individual to help maybe subside some of these symptoms. So you can learn to live with it in a productive way. Absolutely. Okay. You can learn to manage. Okay. So what are, let's, let's start here. What are some of the main mental health issues that Black women deal with, Dr. Shaw? Well, for the most part, um, I would say depression, anxiety, a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's generally resulting from years and generations of basic, typical racial discrimination that, that is observed, that is experienced um, in the communities, in the home. And then the more serious ones can be like the bipolar disorders, the schizophrenia, and even the um, phobias, like the agoraphobia, fear of leaving home, the more the more severe illness, meaning that there's more impairment into to the individual and the way that they function in the world. When you say fear of leaving home, mm -hmm. you mean like home from your parents or... What does that mean? No, the actual phobia, the fear that something catastrophic will happen if one actually leaves the, the house, safety of their own home. The comforts of their yes. own home. Mm -hmm. And that's on the more severe side of right. the mental illness spectrum. But we are seeing a rise in that specifically due to um, a lot of issues of dealing with racism and dealing with genderism, just the different differentials between male and and female. Yeah. I'm from Houston, Texas. That's my hometown, right? Okay. And it's an open carry state. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've not been home. Well, I go home often, but <laughs> I've been in I've been in Los Angeles for quite some time now, and the gun laws here are much more strict yes. than the gun laws in Texas. And I was in Target at, in, in Texas, and and I just saw a man <laughs> with a gun on his on his waist, and I was like, "Oh Lord, what they what are they about to do in here?" You know, like I just cringed, and I was like, "Where am I? I'm in like at the wild wild west." So mm -hmm. I can understand the fear of leaving home when you're under circumstance. I was like, "I gotta get back to the West Coast. This is I don't want to see you with the gun." Like he wasn't a police officer. He wasn't in the military. So we just walking around with the guns. And so, yeah, there's a lot to be 
fearful of today in this world because racism has also kind of resurfaced in a different way. Absolutely. And I think that you you speak very correctly that just moving from not only state to state, but from city to city, zip code to zip code, there's a very different culture that exists between different ethnicities and cultures and what is socially acceptable. Yeah. And, and so we have to learn to navigate not only the bigger um, Eurocentric views of racism and oppression that have been, you know, hundreds of years in the making, but also the more accessible cultural ones that are just within our own communities, just crossing mm -hmm. street signs. Yeah. Yeah. I also remember going into the grocery store when I was in Houston mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know, I had a t-shirt on that said something or another. I don't think it was anything worth reading, but I remember the chef, uh, not the chef, who's the, the butcher, the guy mm -hmm. behind the meat department. Mm -hmm. The, the butcher said, well, what kind of shirt is that you got on? Because everybody's walking around here with these different shirts. I need to read it. And I just I just threw me for a loop. I was like, what? What? You know, and I had to catch myself. And um, I mean, because I'm like, who's reading shirts? And what happens if you read my shirt? Like, what's next? Mm. So there is this certain paranoia that's happening um, for black people. And I would imagine black women the most, Dr. Billups. Um, according to research, black women are actually more likely to experience intimate partner violence than white women. And then they have to deal with resulting mental issues such as depression, which you brought up, uh, and suicide. So why is this? Why, why are we facing these mental situations? Why, why us? Why us? That's a very good question. Um, I like the fact that you brought up the fact that black women are um, having issues in, in terms of... Um, intimate partner violence. Um, I was doing research the other day and it indicated that 40% of African-American women are susceptible or have been um, attacked. Um, I want to be very transparent here and share that I too was, I met the statistic of that 40%. Right. I was in a relationship with someone who was very abusive. And in the beginning, it always starts off as, you know, you go through that honeymoon phase and yeah. things of that nature. Um, but for us, it wasn't finances or lack of communication that started the abuse. It was control. He needed to be in control. Mm -hmm. And so it, it eventually later on, it did lead to finances because that became an issue in the household as well, you right. know, raising two children in this economy. Mm. Um, so that is the reason that a lot of people experience intimate or specifically African-American women experience um, intimate partner violence. Yeah. I, I, I too have experienced it in college. Mm. So I understand that and I feel what that is. And I also think I look, I'm not the psychologist here, but I feel like black women are so strong that we want to help the black man. We don't want to hurt them. And so when they hurt us, we feel more of a need to be there, to stay there. It's almost like um, when Ike Turner told Tina Turner in the movie, What's Love Got to Do With It? <laughs> okay. So everybody leaves me. And we don't want to be that one to leave them. We don't want right. to be that one to let them down. They've been beaten up by the world. So we want to be the one to stay there and stick it out. And you know, we're tag strong black woman. We've got right. to live by that moniker, that banner. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Right, I'm right. here. I'm not going anywhere. Right. right? right. Um, so, and we often don't think about ourselves, our own mental health. Why is that, Dr. Shaw? Well, honestly, a lot of it is ingrained in ways that we're not even always consciously aware. Um, going back to when we're looking at the way that mental health was um, developed, it mental health treatment and services were at the root developed to treat um, white women with mental health problems in the traditional heterosexual relationship, marriage of Christianity or Catholicism faith, you know, having children and living in a socioeconomic class of, you know, middle to higher end income. And so when when that is the the cultural norm that is is given to us, us being people of color, then when it comes to treating mental health issues um, within our culture, our 
our the way that our symptoms present mm -hmm. and the way that we experience them are very different. So they don't often fit within the model mm -hmm. that it was designed. And so unfortunately, as you mentioned, that that stereotypical bravado of the strong black woman who is independent, is a caregiver, and only uh, it needs to be self-reliant is like transformed into this superwoman of unobtainable goals and, and pressures. And what we are taught very early is we're strong, we can handle it. So either you deal with it or you leave. Mm -hmm. And those are the two options because yeah. it's so ingrained that we're strong, we can handle it. When in honesty, it's cycles of abuse, it's years of control and and very unhealthy emotional patterns mm -hmm. that, you know, start out gradually and then grow and grow and grow. And then you find yourself in a situation where you no longer have the choice because it's been taken away from you. Now it's, I have to be strong and deal with it or yeah. retaliate. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the fact that um, as African-American women, our depression and our mental illness doesn't present as others because mm -hmm. oftentimes it presents as like irritability and or an attitude. That's another moniker that we right. receive, the, right. the angry black woman. Right. Correct. That comes around over and over and over again when really, I wish people understood me. I'm so passionate about mm -hmm. everything I talk about <laughs> that, that, that comes from my heart, but people mistake my passion for anger, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not angry. I just really feel some kind of way about this right. situation. You know, I want to get in there. I want to tackle whatever it is. I want to fix it. I want to... Uh, uh, speaking of, though, when we talk about the strong black woman, when we talk about us wanting to stay in and, and fix it and, and make it all right, um, it comes to our resilience. So let's talk about the resilience. Like, what is resilience and how can we apply this term to the mental health of black women? So resilience, the definition is just the ability to bounce back. In, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And how we can apply to mental health or this term is to learn to be adaptable, is, is learning words like self-care and self-preservation. And as you mentioned, oftentimes we put everyone's needs before us. We need to learn to put our needs before everybody else. And again, it's not about being selfish, it's about self-preservation. Mm -hmm. And self-love, and yes, and just building on that, I think that Resilience is a beautiful protective factor that that we learn to cope with life's ups and downs, and and it is definitely a strength. But I think that just culturally, we need to redefine what resilience means for us instead of being told what it is. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we define what self love and putting ourselves first looks like. You mean individually, individually, or collectively, collectively as a black. As a black as a black community, as a black woman, as a a receiver of mental health, because my resiliency skills are going to look very different from Dr. Phillips, just dealing with day to day things. Mm -hmm. So but being able to redefine what it means for us to find those things to help us cope and deal with life better with the, the things that are designed to knock us down every you know step of the way. And the fact that we are often knocked down, um, I've talked to another doctor on this podcast that that mentioned, um, you know, they wouldn't even put let her put her Ph.D. Mm -hmm title behind her name, right? And so we are knocked down in the office. We're knocked down at home mm -hmm. in a literal sense sometimes when mm -hmm. we're dealing with these intimate domestic issues. So the question becomes, uh, uh, there's a certain percentage of Black women who won't even seek help. And I've talked to Black men and I've talked on this podcast about Black men who definitely um, have a harder time seeking help. But why is it that Black women won't do that? Well, I think that there's just so much stigma. Mm -hmm. We are taught collectively as a Black community that we it's better to keep our problems in the home so you don't want to reach out for help and admit you have a problem. So it's very early ingrained in us that depression and anxiety and, and trauma, it's natural. Everybody has it. You just deal with it. Mm -hmm. These aren't things that can be so 
hurtful to your lives that you should seek help. Um, so changing that narrative um, is important. And also just um, allowing the, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to ask Dr. Bill okay. the same question though. Why are we less likely to seek help? And then our white counterparts, obviously. Right. I, I think part of it, as as you mentioned, a lot of it is stigma. But the other part of it is I think we just don't know. Right. We feel mm. that these things are natural. This is how yeah. I've been all my life. So this is normal to me. So what this am I seeking? This is who I am. This is who I am. So what am I seeking help for? This is how big mama did it. This is how my mother did it. So why am I asking for help? Because this is this is how we live. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. So do we think that it's okay to live by the traditions of where we come from? I often wonder that because we come from slavery, right? Mm -hmm. And and I don't mean that in an in a inception sense. I mean mm -hmm. that's what we've gone through. That's the part that they tell us. That's the part that we know about the most. And there was nothing good about that time period for right. us. So if we're still relying on the efforts and 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 the solutions of slavery, how in the heck can they be applied in 2023? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with, like Dr. Billups says, is really um, getting the word out there and normalizing these conversations about mental health that we don't have to struggle. There are different ways of helping. It doesn't have to be individual therapy. It can be support groups. It can be finding mentorship in your community um, among women that are like-minded and, and goal-driven like you, or even, you know, a mommy support group, just people that are have the same goals and mm -hmm. and want to support each other and lift each other. Uh, Dr. Absolutely. Phillips, we're so busy. How do we have time for that? <laughs> you know we got what? these kids. <laughs> we I got this job. I got soccer. I got, uh, I don't know, all that stuff y'all with children got to do with the, I got to make the dinner. I got to make the breakfast, the lunch. You know, I, I got to do it all. I got to clean the house, you know. I, I got to make love to my husband. Right. That's, you know, that yeah. becomes pretty chorable too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know it's, if that's a word, but I've made it up today. <laughs> I like it. Um, <laughs> I think it starts off with creating boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, and Ooh. learning to say no. Um, you don't owe anyone an explanation. No is a statement itself, you know, um, because like you said, we we're pulled different, many different ways. Yeah, and I don't we know how to fit therapy in there. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, huh? But you have to find a way. So here's the thing: um, if we don't if we don't seek help, mm -hmm. the body will force us oh, to get help. That's... Right? There's a book called "The Body Keeps the Score," and when we act in a way um, and we're not addressing our mental health needs, then we start to have chronic medical issues. Mm. And so, and we if... definitely check on that, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Once oh, you yeah. can't literally and physically deal with making love to your husband and going to soccer games, and now you've got a physical problem. So, I, I mean, I'd love, like, I never even thought of it like that. It's the mental problems that create the physical problems. Correct. Absolutely. Oh, man. And we are statistically the higher... Um, the higher, we have a higher percentage of medical issues like hypertension, diabetes, chronic inflammation, mm -hmm. um, heart disease. All of these things are relevant um, and prominent in our community because it's so ingrained within us to deal with the mental anguish that it, if we're not actively trying to make space and time and solutions for it, then like you said, the body is going to let you know. It's going to slow you down. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask, what can we do to help ourselves <laughs> to support our own mental wellness? But you just said it. But I'll ask in case there's something else, Dr. Billups. What can we do? To help ourselves? Yes. Well, I think this is a good start. Okay. Definitely having a lot of conversations. Cheers here. Cheers to you. Cheers to you. Cheers to you. Yes. A lot of conversations about mental health. Mm -hmm. I also think it's important for individuals to see that... Um, as black women, black psychologists, um, maybe they'll want to seek help because it's important to sit in front of somebody that looks like you right. and can understand you and speaks the same lingo. And I think this will open up doors for many people. And not judge you. And not judge you. Yeah. And actually know what 
what you've experienced. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And validate that experience. Absolutely. As opposed to saying, well, can you look at it this way? Right. And so I said, no, I understand. I get what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Uh, Dr. Shaw. And also, there is nothing um, bad about holding on to that um, stereotype and image of the strong black woman because we are and we all embody it and we all move in it differently and that's okay the problem becomes when we let that define us where we don't allow ourselves to feel validated or important enough to reach out for help Mm. or say that we need support or accept or accept that things aren't going as we'd like or we're not happy or even allowing ourselves to fail you know it's yeah. we don't allow ourselves to fail we take it as a personal um avenue of shame when everybody in life hits roadblocks everybody stumbles but we have to be honest and real with ourselves and be able to say that you know what we're not above that and reaching out isn't weakness reaching out for support is strength right. yes absolutely and we are here to give you strength every single week because you are not alone so thank you doc th- thank you so much dr shaw and dr billups i appreciate you being here we hope you learned a few things about your mental health and wellness and if you want to find out more you can visit our websites and we're going to provide a link in a bit We'll have some resources as well as more information about our guest. But more importantly, we hope you will come back and join us on our next program. And remember, we wish you well on your health journey, your journey to good health and satisfying lives. I'm Tammy Mack, and you are not alone. The opinions expressed by our guests or hosts do not necessarily reflect the views of KGLH Los Angeles or the Chicago School. The Chicago School or KGLH Los Angeles are not responsible for the consequences of any actions based on information or resources provided to these programs. The Chicago School and KGLH Los Angeles disclaim any liability related to any podcast content.